debate. The Honourable Member for London North Centre. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. It is a great honour and pleasure to rise in the House today to speak about the government's plan to repeal provisions in the Citizenship Act, as this is, as this is a concern relating to citizenship, which is so central to Canadian identity, and matters of immigration, which are central to the Canadian story, it is especially an honour as the son of immigrants to be here today. I want to also mention, Mr. Speaker, that I will be sharing my time with the member from Davenport. As the provisions only apply to Can Canadians with dual or multiple citizenships, they contribute to the creation of a two-tiered system, Mr. Speaker. It is unacceptable in a democratic society that dual or multiple nationals are vulnerable to losing their citizenship. Mr. Speaker, this was a point that was raised time and again by stakeholders and private individuals when the previous legislation, Bill C-24, was first introduced. Groups as varied as the Canadian Bar Association, Mr. Speaker, the, the British Columbia Civil Liberties Association, the Canadian Association of Refugee Lawyers, the Ontario Council of Agencies Serving Immigrants, and Amnesty International. I would like to quote just a few of these concerns, Mr. Speaker. David Mattis of B'nai B'rith, who testified before the House of Commons Standing Committee on Citizenship and Immigration, stated, and I quote, that we should not be revoking the citizenship of Canadians for crimes committed after the acquisition of citizenship, no matter what the crime, Mr. Speaker. And I want to emphasize that point that Mr. Mattis made. I'll continue with his quote. Once a person becomes a Canadian citizen and commits a crime, then he is our criminal, Mr. Speaker. We should not pretend otherwise. Barbara Jackman, speaking on behalf of the Canadian Bar Association, stated before the same committee that, quote, for people who are born here, who have grown up here, if we can result, it can result, excuse me, in banishment and exile. She went on to observe, observe that we punish people through the criminal justice system. And in their submission to the Standing Committee on Citizen Citizenship and Immigration on Bill C-24, the Ontario Council of Agencies Serving Immigrants stated that in their view, quote, treating dual citizens differently is discriminatory and violates the fundamental principles that citizens are all equal. Citizens should not face different consequences for committing the same crimes. Creating separate rules for dual citizens creates a two-tiered citizenship with lesser rights for some citizens. Mr. Speaker, these are just a few of the many examples of organizations and individuals publicly expressing their view that the revocation measures created two different kinds of citizenship. Many of my constituents in London North Centre, Mr. Speaker, have told me that this is unacceptable. I heard it throughout the election campaign and I've heard it since. There is great support for this bill in London North Centre. My constituents want all Canadians to be treated fairly and with a high level of respect. London, Ontario was built on immigration, and many Londoners hold dual or multiple citizenship, Mr. Speaker. These are extremely proud Canadians who value and respect this beautiful country. We have an obligation to be fair and respectful to them as well. Our government has listened to these concerns, and Bill C-6 clearly addresses them. No government should ever have the ability to take away an individual's Canadian citizenship. Any Canadian who commits a crime ought to be punished. There is no debate on that point at all, Mr. Speaker, on this side of the House. And I'm happy to say with my honourable colleagues in the NDP. However, the revocation of citizenship crosses a line that we must never accept, Mr. Speaker. Without citizenship, the rights and equality we all enjoy become meaningless. Canada is a country that prides itself on solid democratic principles and foundations and is an example for other nations. However, playing fast and loose with the definition of citizenship is a very slippery slope, Mr. Speaker, and inevitably calls into question our leadership in this area. I again point to the importance of my constituents. I'm here to represent them and I want to reference what I have heard on the ground as their MP. I have heard loud and clear from my constituents in London North Centre that fair treatment of all Canadians 
and dedication to the principles of democracy, tolerance, and equality is what they expect in their elected official, and more than this, in the Government of Canada, Mr. Speaker. I would also like to add that while this position reflects my stand and that of our government, it was a former Conservative Prime Minister, John Diefenbaker, who held this view, and I'm glad to continue that point in the debate that will, I assume, follow. By introducing this bill, we are taking concrete steps to return to a system where all citizens are created equal, treated equal, excuse me, regardless of whether they are dual or multiple nationals, Mr. Speaker. This is a commitment our party made before forming government, and we are following through now. This is a matter of principle and fundamental values for us. There should be one tier, only one tier, of Canadian citizenship. I have no doubt that members in this House are concerned about security, and I want to turn to that point now for a moment. I can assure all of them that we remain unwavering in our commitment to protect the safety and security of Canadians. Canadians convicted of treason and terrorism will be dealt with through our justice system, Mr. Speaker. As the Minister of Immigration has stated, we have courts and we have prisons in Canada. Offenders will not go unpunished. As well, there are measures in place for someone, excuse me, as well, there are measures in place before someone becomes a citizen. A person may, de may, be, may be denied a visa or other travel document, refused entry to or removed from Canada for security reasons or criminal activity preventing them from becoming citizens. Furthermore, prohibitions, gr prohibition grounds in the Citizenship Act remain in effect barring individuals convicted of certain offences or who are engaged in activities against the national interest from acquiring citizenship in the first place. Moreover, repealing the national interest grounds would not affect the ability to revoke citizenship where it was obtained fraudulently. The minister would continue to have authority to revoke citizenship in basic fraud cases. Furthermore, the federal court would continue to have authority to decide on cases where the fraud is in relation to a fact regarding security, human or international rights, violations, or organized criminality. The ability to revoke citizenship where it was obtained fraudulently has been in place since the first Canadian Citizenship Act came into force in 1947, Mr. Speaker, and it will continue to be in place. Three additional proposed amendments included in this bill will further enhance the integrity of the citizenship program. The first is to include conditional sentences, sentence orders in the prohibition prohibitions. The second is to ensure that the need for applicants to meet citizenship requirements for the, from the time that their grant of citizenship is approved to the time that they take the oath applies to all applicants. The third would provide authority for the minister to seize documents that are fraudulent or are being used fraudulently when provided for the, uh, the administration of the Citizenship Act. Mr. Speaker, as we have emphasized, Canada's commitment to diversity and inclusion, inclusion is essential, powerful, and an ambitious approach to make Canada and the world a better and safer place. A Canadian is a Canadian, and that must never change, Mr. Speaker. Bill C-6 will bring us closer to putting this principle into action and to remaining the open tolerant and diverse country that we have that we have been throughout our history mr speaker and i hope we will continue to be thank you very much uh, questions and comments the honorable member for cumberland colchester thank you very much mr speaker i appreciate this uh, look i i want to commend the member, member from london north central on his remarks and i know He's uh, well qualified to talk about this issue, and he has a genuine interest in safety and justice and security for all Canadians. And he's worked tirelessly on several different aspects, and I credit him for that, and I applaud him. He recently tabled a private member's bill on non-state torture. I wonder if he could tell us if there's any connection between his private member's bill and C6, and maybe he could tell us a little bit about his private member's bill and how, uh, how we might apply that here and how we could support it, and if there's any connection and parallels. Thank you. Oh, member for London North Centre. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you very much uh, to my honourable colleague. 
uh, my private member's bill, uh, Bill C-242, which, uh, which proposes a uh, addition to the criminal code, Mr. Speaker, a charge of inflicting torture. Uh, we do have a charge uh, on the books now as it stands in our criminal code that applies a torture offence that applies to acts of torture uh, carried out by state officials, Mr. Speaker, but there is no uh, there is no offence in our criminal code that will recognize equivalent acts carried out by private individuals operating in the private realm who are not state officials. Uh, these, this has happened in the past, Mr. Speaker. There are many instances and examples. And the bill that I have proposed is a measure introduced to boost the public safety of Canada, but also to do so in a way that underlines human rights principles and enshrines those further in the criminal code of Canada. When we protect human rights, we increase uh, public safety. The UN Declaration of Human Rights, Mr. Speaker, in Article 5, condemns torture. Our criminal code condemns torture, but only in part. It needs to go one step further, and therefore I thank my honourable colleague for allowing me to, to present this, uh, to, to sum up the bill for colleagues who might not know about it at this stage. Uh, question and comments, uh, Questions and comments. The Honourable Member for Salaverie-sur-Roi. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to say that my colleagues and I in the NDP are very pleased to see this bill was tabled by the Liberals because from the outset we were opposed to Conservative Bill C-24 that created two classes of citizens for our immigrants and had many prejudicial and probably unconstitutional measures in there. But there are many things that could still be improved. In the next budget, do the Liberals intend to reduce the fees for a family of four, for example? The fees would be almost $1,500, which reduces opportunities or increases difficulty for immigrant families to become Canadian citizens. Mr. Speaker, in this party, we believe in public consultation. The Minister of Finance, along with the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Finance, carried out many consultations uh, throughout the country. Individual MPs, including myself, including my colleagues around me, uh, carried out these consultations in their own writings. Uh, we have presented reports to the Ministry of Finance uh, and the, uh, the Minister of Finance in particular, and these will be reviewed. Uh, we have, we uh, thank the, uh, I thank the honourable colleague across the way for raising this issue. It's a matter that, uh, that deserves, to, uh, deserves scrutiny and I'm sure will be looked at, uh, but uh, this is all part of the process. We're listening to Canadians, we're listening to colleagues across the way, and these, uh, these uh, suggestions will uh, certainly be reviewed. Uh, questions and comments. The Honourable Member for Sherwood Park, Port Saskatchewan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, this is a very important debate because we're talking about Canadian identity, whether we would require that for those who are going to remain citizens that they buy into a certain basic set of principles, like not being involved in terrorism. I, I want to read a quote from the Prime Minister and ask the Honourable Member if he agrees. The Prime Minister told the New York Times uh, that there is no core identity, no mainstream in Canada, and he said that we are the first post-national state. I wonder if the member agrees with the Prime Minister about Canada having no core identity. Uh, the Honourable Member for London North Centre. Mr. Speaker, the member ought to look again because the Prime Minister has said that Canadian identity is based around fundamental values, freedom of tolerance, of democracy. This is what Canada is about. And I would also go one step further to remind my honourable colleague, since he is fond, apparently, of looking at quotations from prime ministers, that it was a conservative prime minister, Mr. John Diefenbaker, who in fact changed the law in 1958 so that no Canadian could have their citizenship taken away from them. So I would underline that point to the honourable member and simply say that the history of the Conservative Party, at least in the past, is to stand up for basic democratic principles and values. Mr. Diefenbaker did it. Why can't this Conservative Party do it? Wow. Resuming debate.